What are the most stressful jobs in the world? What countries are people most stressed in? And why has stress in the workplace become such a huge problem? These are all the things we're going to talk about in the weekly roundup today because it is an enormous problem. It is enormous economically because companies can't get the production they want. It's physically people sort of being signed off for work sort of with mental health issues. It's sort of from a moral perspective and just sort of like an enjoyment of work, which is sort of I do think is having a ripple effect over what else is going on in the world. It is such a problem. And so what we're going to look at today is exactly that. Why is it such a big problem? Where are the core issues and what can we do about it? I'm going to start off by just giving you a few numbers. So the cost of workplace stress in the US alone is starting to cost $300 billion by some estimates. That is absolutely ludicrous. Check it out. I like to keep the economy in mind because I know that whatever impacts the economy impacts my clients. And it turns out stress is impacting the economy in a massive way. What if I told you that, by some estimates, the cost of work-related stress in the U.S. is close to $300 billion annually? $300 billion annually? I mean, that is a ludicrous amount of money. And that's just one country. And I think, you know, it's so much so that stress at workplace is becoming an industry in its own right. So the workplace stress management market is on the rise. It's expected to hit $16 billion by 2033. People literally sort of developing things to kind of help people out of stress at work. Now, I'm all for growing the economy. That doesn't feel like the healthiest market. And Amazon are a great example of this. There's the amount of sort of tools that you have on Amazon or toys or, you know, sort of things that you can use to kind of help remedy from sort of sprays to sort of stress balls to all this sort of thing is absolutely crazy. And I'm going to start off by looking at what are the top five most stressful industries. Now, I'm going to say, by the way, I know that all jobs can be stressful. And so I really don't want you to think I'm undermining your job or your perspective because everyone has a stressful job in some ways. It can all get. So I'm just looking at the data here of what it is. Now, the sort of top five sectors, as it were, which are causing the most stress. And I don't think there's going to be any huge surprises here. But number one, the first one is human health and social work. So that's therapists, that's social care, that's care homes, like all of that sort of thing. That is listed as number one, the most most stressful job in the world. And I'm going to come on to why that is and what my theories are and all of that once I've gone through this list. Now, number two is public defence. Now, when I say public defence, I'm talking things like police, I'm talking things like prison workers, um, and all of that sort of stuff. Number three is education. So that's fairly obvious. It's, you know, teachers. Um, and you know other people in the educational sector. And then number four is professional, scientific, and technical industries. Now, that sounds quite broad, but in reality, think lawyers, public defenders. I'm not necessarily talking about the high-end law. I'm talking a lot of these are actually in the sort of uh, civil service, sort of um, public s- space. And then number five, we have finance. If I look at those five things, I think there's a couple of trends which I'd like to pick up on. So firstly, I want to talk about pay. Now, finance aside, a lot of those first four jobs are really underpaid. And I think that Look, I think we underpay a lot of roles. I think we overpay some roles. I think we underpay a lot of roles. And I think these types of roles in particular, I'm thinking social care, I'm thinking teachers, I'm thinking nurses, I'm thinking doctors, all of that sort of thing. I think we criminally underpay them because it, it just basically tells people they're not important sectors. And if people go into them, they're not sort of worthy. And this sort of undermining of them is crazy. And it doesn't shock me that these are the sort of most stressful industries because you're dealing with horrendous stuff, like horrendous stuff. You know, a good example, right? My mum was a palliative care nurse for decades. And her job was to literally help people who are terminally ill kind of manage that process. So the awful part about that job is you'd get to know your patients, but they would always die. I mean, that the people who go through that sort of stuff, the people who kind of take that responsibility on for society. I get paid so much more than my mum and my most stressful day wouldn't crack her top 500. And so I do think it's, it, it's important to sort of raise awareness of this. Now, the other reason why I think these sectors in particular are, I think there's a hope element to it. And the reason why I say that is I found this clip, which I found really, really interesting about this. And it's talking about stress and whether stress is actually good for you. People who have high levels of stress live shorter lives than people who have lower levels of stress in their lives. But then when we stratify them further into people who have high levels of stress, but view stress positively, as in it's getting you ready to overcome a challenge, it's making your body more fit, this is something that's needed for growth mindset. Those people, even when you compare them to people who had less stress, they live longer. 
So it's not only how much stress we have, but also how we view stress. I think that's really important, you know. In fact, I think it's really important the more I think about it because my interpretation of this is this, right? If you feel like you're building towards something, you can handle stress because stress is where you grow. So like the parts of the job, which I often think is most important is the bits you can't really do. It's the bits where you see growth because if you know how to do all of your job and nothing changes, you can kind of get a little bit lethargic with your career. And so it's important to have 10, 15, 20% of the job, which you don't know how to do because it's a bit more exciting exciting because it's new, because you can kind of develop it all. But the problem with that is if, and I go back to these sectors, if you don't feel like you're doing any good or working towards something or being able to solve something, you, it feels hopeless. And I think that's such a damaging thing to people's, one, morale, but two, that feeds into the stress element. Because, example, right? I, you know, I ran a business and there was a lot of parts that were quite stressful, but I always felt like I was building something, right? I always felt it was working towards an end goal, which was whether to sell or keep growing or whatever it might be. And so my stressful days, I could, I could sort of say, right, actually, look, yes, that was a rubbish day, but, you know, it's kind of part of the journey, part of the progress. If you're in social care or if you're in the NHS or if you're working as a teacher and you just feel like you're fighting as the type but there's just no way you can kind of overcome the challenges because of systemic issues or whatever it might be I do think that's got to be a playing into people's stress levels because I, I, I agree with this clip I think stress is really good if channeled in the right way and giving people a fighting chance to actually do it but if you can't you're then just stressed and there's no outlet and I do think that's definitely going to be something that's feeding into it all and then finally the outlier is the finance uh, sector now look I know you know, all that sort of stuff, right? They're incredibly well paid. I know people have a lot of issues with the finance sector, etc. But there's no denying that the hours some of these people work are just absolutely ludicrous. And I'll give you a good example is we've got junior bankers from, you know, this is a Bloomberg article talking about junior bankers logging a hundred hour work weeks. 100 hours. If you take five days as the broad working week, which, you know, <laughs> it feels weird to have to say, but if you take the five, that's 20 hours a week. That's 20 hours a day. Sorry. I mean, that's not healthy. That's not worth it. That's not like, do you know what I mean? So like, it, it, I know people say, oh, but they're incredibly well paid. And, all, and of course they are. Of course they are. They, and they would be the first to admit that. And that's one of the big motivators of the finance sector. You get very well paid. But 100 hour weeks, no wonder you have bloody stress. You're not sleeping. You're not having fun. You're not doing anything. So again, like I think it, it is an interesting one that they're in the top five. And I, I'm not surprised. I think they've got an incredibly stressful job because they work such long hours in under enormous pressure a lot of the time. And it is a different sort of pressure for sure than some of the other sectors that I've flagged. But I do think it's really, really interesting. What I find in most interesting about this problem, stress in the workplace is causing so many issues for everyone. This is one of those like rare moments in the workplace where actually if it got better, it would benefit everyone involved from the most senior CEO in the world to kind of the most junior of junior entry level roles. Because basically, if everyone's enjoying their job, stress goes down, people be more productive, economy booms, people get more money out of the companies and shareholders and all that sort of thing. And alongside that, if you're enjoying your job, you're just in a better state. And so what I find particularly interesting at it is how this problem has been allowed to develop into such a systemic issue. Because there is no, you know, you can always understand, right? There are always some problems you sort of go, well, look, I don't like it, but I can see how we've ended up in the position that we are because of X, Y, and Z. Here, I'm just looking at this going, this is a disaster for everyone. No one is benefiting from this problem. And it's when you say that out loud, you just think, well, hang on, why, why is it such a problem? And why is it becoming such an issue? I mean, to give you an un there's a Sky News report where workplace absences have hit their highest level in over a decade. Highest level in over a decade. Like, this is not something that's going away. And the obvious point in this article is, if you want to retain your team because they feel, you know, they're not feeling so stressed, you need to address this. And the more I think about it, the more I think Forbes, this article in Forbes, has the right idea. So it basically was looking at the disparity between execs and employees. So if we if we take the view that everyone wants this to get better, right? Because everyone does. It's everyone in their best interest. Where is the breakdown? It has to come from a communication challenge. So Forbes says this, according to the survey, approximately 90% of executives believe their company positively impacts worker well-being and career advancement. Yet only 60% of workers share this view. 
Now, I read that and thought, hmm, OK, here we go. So basically what that's sort of implying is everyone think, everyone think acknowledges it's a problem. However, the disparity is executives and senior people in businesses are thinking they're doing a lot better job than they actually are. And I do think that's important to recognise because, again, like I'm not just here to sort of talk about from a business perspective because, of course, economically, I want my employees to work as hard as possible. You know, I want everyone to enjoy their job. But it's beneficial for everyone else involved if they enjoy their job as well because, you know, the World Health Organization um, did a lot of research into this and they found out that decent work is actually really good for your mental health. The problem at the moment is poor work environment. So decent work, so for example, you know, if it provide a livelihood, a sense of confidence, purpose, achievement, an opportunity for positive relationships and meeting all these new people, a platform for structured routines, like all these benefits come from it. And yet at the moment we're not maximized. So again, you have this weird scenario where you say, well, actually a job, if done right, can be very good for you because it does give you that purpose, it does allow you to meet more people, it gives you that routine, that structure in life, etc. But it's breaking down somewhere. And it gets even more interesting when we start to look at this from a generational perspective, because there's been a lot of research done in regards to which is the most stressed out generation. And by far and away, it is Gen Z. There is a BBC research piece that came out that basically said Gen Z's are the most stressed demographic in the workplace and struggling mightily to cope. It shows that 23% of Gen Z's believe they have unmanageable stress effects impacting their work life. Unmanageable. Not 23% think, oh, I sometimes have a stressful job. 23% say they've got such stress in the workplace that it's unmanageable. That should be sending terrifying klaxons going through the workplace and people in charge because that's not sustainable. A quarter of the newest generation of the workforce have unmanageable levels of stress. Like, what on earth is going on? And I think Simon Sinek summarizes this really, really well. I got three people who quit because they said they were burnt out. And I was like, <laughs> you, I know how much work you do. What do you mean you're burnt out? So I'm like, do you have another job on the side? <laughs> how can you be burnt out? You know? What I discovered is they were the impasse on the team and everybody was calling them to unload. They were burnt out because they were taking on everybody's stress and they were exhausted. They couldn't take it anymore and they just quit. And when I talked about this publicly, I had a 23-year-old come up to me in one of the companies and said, I do that. And so we have to recognize they are struggling in a changing, chaotic, crazy world right now where there's so much uncertainty in this world like like, the world is always uncertain, but my God, it's war, and the country's at its, each other's throat, and there's challenge, and the global warming, and it's just insane, these poor kids. And they have no outlet. They don't know how to deal with it. So my, my big, my big uh, uh, it's a challenge for all of us, is how do we hold space for them? And the problem is, is they don't even recognize when we're doing the right thing for them. That's the hardest part. I think that's a really important clip to understand because, look, I know it's tempting sometimes to say, oh, you know, kids these days, they just don't work as hard and all that sort of thing. And I always say, look, this, the numbers are too high for that. The numbers are too high. Like, you can't have a quarter of a generation just suddenly be lazy. Like, that's obviously not a thing. And so as soon as you kind of recognise and acknowledge that point, you start to think, well, hang on, there must be something deeper going on systemically in the workplace. And I think this is a really good point. I think, you know, there is so much going on in the world. I think, you know, where, uh, social media amplification, it could be how polarised some some countries are. You know, all there's so many factors at play. But there is a general level of pessimism, which kind of goes back to the hope bit, which I spoke about. There is a level of pessimism, which is feeding into the workplace and making everyone feel just that much more stressed about everything. Time to thank our sponsor of this video, Virtual Speech. Now, asking for a pay rise is scary. Asking for a promotion is scary. And it's completely understandable to find yourself getting tongue-tied or really worried about how you're going to say it and what your boss might say and all of that sort of thing. It's why I always, always, always tell everyone to practice before they go into these meetings. In a mirror, to a friend, to a partner, whatever it might be. Well, now I can actually go one better. Virtual Virtual Speech is a VR application that also works online and it allows you to role play specific work scenarios. It's honestly 
incredible. What it will do is it will record you doing it. It will then analyze what you are saying, how you're saying, and give you genuinely helpful advice on how to improve it. Everything from speech analysis, like inflections and whether you stumble over words and like your words speed and all of that. It looks at hand gestures and analyze that and whether you're sort of you know authoritative enough and all that sort of thing. And it's the perfect way to help support your ambitions. Information is all in my bio. It's supported in multiple languages. It covers all sorts of work scenarios from speeches, public speaking, presentations, tricky management conversations, whatever it might be. And I tell you, it really, really is good. I'm honestly so impressed by it. So please do check it out. Links all in my bio. Now, back to the main video. And alongside this, you have the most stressed out countries. Now, <laughs> you, you won't be shocked to find the US is pretty high up here. Um, you know, US quite, f I, do, I do think quite famously, it's not too harsh. I do think have quite an unhealthy relationship with work. Uh, I don't mean that as a negative, by the way. I, I actually, you know, I've, I've had offices in the US, like I've done a lot of work in the US. I have so much admiration for the US work ethic in so many ways. But there are a couple of things where I do think from a cultural perspective, it borderlines unhealthy. And I do think these numbers back it up. So the US and Canadian workforces experienced the highest levels of daily stress globally. Employees in these countries reported stress levels of 57%, which when you combine that to Western Europe, for example, stress declined from the 39%. So, you know, we're sort of seeing the US and I think the problem with you, and again, like this Gallup global report numbers are the percentage of people that said yes when asked if they experience stress on a daily basis. And the US is up to 49% on that. And, you know, the problem with that is it then starts leading into kind of joking sort of elements like this. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? Really good. Just finishing up everything before lunch today. Oh yeah, you have that presentation this afternoon, right? Yeah, all part of the hustle though, right? Yeah, for sure. I gotta bring home the big bucks. I'll probably have lunch while I work. Ooh, smart. I have a meeting this afternoon, so I'll probably do the same. Do we have an ETA on that report we were talking about yesterday, by the way? Oh yeah, I did it last night. I'll send it to you now. You are a star. And look, you know, I, I have no issues with people working hard. You know, I've worked incredibly hard um, over the years. So it would be unbelievably hypocritical for me to say, oh, don't work hard and all that sort of thing. But I do think it's got to be their choice. I think the unhealthy part and where the sort of stress starts to feed is not everyone wants to work hard. Some people are perfectly happy, you know, making their money enough to kind of get through the lives that they want, etc., etc. But I think when you've got a culture of everyone sort of feeding and saying, no, you have to do this and you're afraid if you don't. And, oh, my God, have you done this? And this sort of overall culture. And then that's where the stress element comes to. That's where the cracks start appearing. And that's where it starts to lead to these kind of bigger challenges that we're facing. Because, again, I, and I do want to really emphasize this point, right? This is benefiting no one. Look at the numbers around how many people are down in regards to how much production production is down. You know, the UK is a great example of that. You know, how many work days are being missed out, which is obviously billable days for people due to mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it's something we really do need to do. And so how do we address these problems? Well, one of the things I always say is, you know, you know, if, if one of my team is stressed, et cetera, I, I always say this to them. I do find it helps. And look, again, it's really hard for me to give stress advice because people at different levels, I don't know the context, et cetera. So I think it's always important for me to caveat that. But one of those lines that I find really helpful, especially with the work, is, is this going to bother you in six months' time? Because some things will. Some things happen in your life that are extremely devastating, sad, hard, whatever it might be, that absolutely will be impacting you in six months' time and potentially forever. Very few of those happen in the workplace. And so I think the point of I'm trying to make is it can feel like the world is ending because everything's important, everything needs to be done, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes you just have to think, look, in the grand schemes, and I do want to emphasize this is so important that this happens at a manager level because it feeds down, right? If a junior, if the manager is stressed, the junior can often feel stressed because of that, etc. But you have to recognize that very few things in the workplace are just like absolutely code red, but it feels like a lot more are. And so is this going to bother me in six months time is a really useful line because it just it just recognizes that sometimes you don't have to take work as seriously as it feels you have. Having a bit of fun is important. And this and this is where I sort of start to disagree with some leaders because they go, oh, you know, it's like having fun at work is one of the easiest, best ways you can solve stress. So when we talk about culture, when we talk about, you know, all these different elements, that is kind of at the root cause of it because, oh, we work hard, play hard is not culture. That's not helpful in any sense of the word. 
but a culture that recognizes mistakes, that doesn't take things too seriously, that can engage people, can have a bit of fun, people will start to pay that back in dividends through their work ethic and through their motivation. But I thought what I'd finish this clip is if you are feeling really stressed, I found this really great clip from Alex Huberman who basically walks you through certain like breathing techniques that can have. And I thought it'd be a good way to kind of finish this off because I do think it's important to kind of provide that sort of support wherever we can. And it goes like this. Stress is an inevitable part of life. There's a pattern of breathing called the physiological sigh that involves two inhales followed by a long exhale. An inhale through your nose very deeply. And then after inhaling as deeply as you can, you're going to try and sneak in a little bit more air on a second inhale also through your nose. And then after you do that, you're going to do a long exhale to the point where your lungs are empty. It goes like this. Just one to three of those physiological sighs can bring you from a state of intense anxiety and stress to very, very calm. That's all for today. Like I said, a really interesting topic that, you know, is go something we're going to talk about a lot, I think, because I do, it doesn't feel like it's getting better at the moment. But as ever, I'll be back next Friday with a new weekly roundup. This is still quite a new series for me. If you are enjoying it, and if there's topics you'd like me to cover, please do just put it in the comments because uh, honestly, I will genuinely, I genuinely read the comments and I really do try and act upon advice and thoughts and feedback, etc. So please do check it out. Um, otherwise, yeah, I will see you all next week.